is that sound? Is that right? No. <gasps> oh, that's a lot of power. Heck yeah, I'm keeping this thing. Let's get started. Hopefully by this point, the hype has finally calmed down, the Apple haters and enthusiasts alike have finally taken their seats, and we can now objectively look at Apple's latest Mac Mini with the M2 Pro chip and see exactly what it's capable of. I've had the privilege of test driving this machine for several weeks now, pretty close to about launch day I'd say, and since then I've definitely developed a pretty strong opinion of exactly what the M2 Pro can do, and hopefully in this objective review, I can give you guys a unbiased, non-hype based, non-hate based response as to whether or not you should buy Apple's latest and greatest Mac Mini with the M2 Pro. So let's get right into it. Starting with design, whether you buy a Mac Mini today or you bought one yesterday, a year ago or even four years ago, the design is practically the same. And I think that's genuinely a great thing in this case. You still have that high quality metallic exterior that we've come to love with those sharp precision cut edges. You of course have the shiny Apple logo with the reflective surface. Now the bottom still has that cheap plastic Mac Mini finishing over here and I gotta be honest it could have done with some rubber grips for more stability so it doesn't slide around but still it looks good enough overall plus it's the bottom of your machine anyway. Now the real difference of course comes in the ports and that's really the only way you can tell the new Mac Minis apart from the old ones so you'll notice you now have a grand total of four Thunderbolt USB-C ports versus two with the original M1 Mac Mini. Additionally you still have a HDMI port however it has has been upgraded to 2.1, meaning you can now run 4K at up to 144 hertz versus just 60 hertz on the previous generation. You still have the ethernet jack, which can be upgraded to a faster 10 gigabit ethernet speed jack. And also of course you have two USB-A ports and the primary power socket. Overall though, I really love this form factor because it's petite enough to fit in tight desk spaces where you might not have all the space in the world. And also if you want a subtle computer presence like I do, it's nice because it just kind of blends in with the environment without dominating like let's say larger machines would. When I was specking my Mac Mini, I had to make some pretty dramatic decisions from the get-go. The first one was whether or not I should get the 10 core or 12 core CPU version of the M2 Pro chip and with the 16 or 19 core GPU respectively. Thankfully, the internet exists and with some spontaneous research ranging between benchmark results, also seeing what other reviewers had to say, and of course good old Reddit with people's personal opinions and experiences, I quickly came to the conclusion the minor variation and improvement of about 3-5% to in real world tests just didn't justify the extra near $400 I would have to cough out here in Canada for that boosted chip, so I stuck with the standard 10 core M2 Pro chip. The next decision I made was probably the most important one. I opted to use that savings in maximizing my unified memory or RAM to 32 gigabytes. This was a super critical decision because what I did next might surprise a lot of people. I opted to get the base 512 gigabyte SSD that comes with the M2 Pro Mac Mini by default. Yes, it does have a slower SSD read and write speed, averaging around 3000 megabytes per second versus the 5000 plus megabytes per second speed of the one terabyte version. But here's the catch, unless you're moving around massive files or working with massive files to begin with, you're not going to notice a difference. I've had this thing for several weeks and I have files ranging anywhere from a couple of hundred megabytes to as much as to 40 to 50 gigabytes. And the fact is that I just don't notice any difference in performance. Now the one catch here is that you want to make sure you have enough RAM because otherwise you run into hard drive swapping where basically when your computer runs out of memory, it actually 
utilize on your hard drive to kind of provide a little bit of buffer for that extra memory. But if you have enough RAM to begin with, the chances of this happening in the first place significantly reduce, which is why I say it was super essential to maximize my RAM. And as a result, I didn't see the need to upgrade to a faster one terabyte SSD. Also, I archive most of my projects as soon as I'm done with them. So my hard drive actually remains pretty empty for most of the times. So you're still here, eh? I am so happy to see that. If you're enjoying the content, please consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. Not only does it help me grow, it also keeps me motivated to provide more quality content just like this. Let's keep going. Now let's talk about real world performance and I'll base it entirely off my use case as that's the only real way I can actually gauge it anyway. So of course, the fact is that pretty much every video you've seen in the past, I'd say several weeks, including this one, was actually produced on my M2 Pro Mac Mini, which basically means that I'm taking all that 10-bit 422 footage from my Sony A7 and obviously processing it all on this computer. And the fact is that my previous M1 Mac Mini with its 16 gigabytes of unified memory was starting to struggle a little bit. There were occasional frame drops. If I added too many effects or too many layers, it became a somewhat choppy experience. Now with the M2 Pro, none of that is a problem any longer. In fact, I do multi-layer 4K video editing pretty frequently. And on my timeline, I have yet to experience a single frame drop other than maybe some technical issue with the effects themselves, it runs perfectly smooth. And on top of that, I keep it on the original playback setting as opposed to optimized playback setting. And I still have no problems with this chip. I've yet to hit its limitation point per se. I think it can easily handle 6K and potentially even 8K video editing without breaking a sweat. And of course that 32 gigabytes of unified memory really come in clutch here because I'm not relying again on hard drive swapping. So the performance doesn't have any depreciation at any given point. Now it is of course worth noting that if your use case is more graphically intensive, then those lower GPU core counts versus the max and ultra chips might make a difference. So if you're doing, let's say animation, or you're even gaming on a Mac, which honestly would be the most ridiculous thing you could do with your Mac, but those kind of things are where your GPU core count might actually matter. Or maybe you might want to consider getting the more higher and 19 core GPU version of the M2 Pro. One area where I was a little disappointed is render times. I'll be honest, compared to my original M1 Mac Mini, render times were only marginally better. I'd say that a five gigabyte file, for example, still takes a couple of minutes to render, and it's only maybe about 10, 15 seconds faster compared to the original M1 Mac Mini. Now, I do believe this will get better over time with optimizations, but the M1 Max chip, for example, has considerably faster render times. And of course, this is primarily due to the fact that it has a additional media encoding engine, which again, helps with rendering speeds considerably. Now, for me, thankfully, I only really render a handful of times in a week and those extra 10, 15 minutes I wait accumulatively in a week just aren't enough for me to justify to get a more expensive Mac Studio. However, if you are someone who renders really large, let's say 10 plus gigabyte files on a regular basis, you'll definitely benefit from getting the more powerful Max or Ultra chips or waiting for the next generation M2 Max or Ultra chips as well. That's my honest opinion. Render speeds are the less impressive part of this computer overall. Now, other than that, I think this is a very powerful computer. If your needs are any lower than let's say 4K video editing, if you're just doing 1080p video editing, or you're just using it for general stuff, you don't need the M2 Pro to begin with. You can probably do just fine with the 16 gigabyte variant of the standard M2 chip. And that's just where I would put things in terms of real world performance. Another thing that often goes understated with Mac minis is just how power and heat efficient they are. Obviously the power efficiency comes from the M2 chips themselves but the cool thing is despite having the M2 Pro chip on here and even when I'm running this thing at its most intensive workflow the fact is I've never actually heard the fan on this thing now I'm sure it's running in some capacity but you just can't detect the additional sound that's how efficient these things are and unlike the MacBooks which have a much slimmer body you have way more airflow over here so ultimately you are getting more performance even with similar hardware. Another thing worth noting is thanks to the additional Thunderbolt 4 ports this time around, you can now connect a total of three 4K external displays 
two via the Thunderbolt 4 port, and one thanks to the HDMI 2.1 port. Now, one design flaw that still exists is the placement of the headphone jack. It's still beneath the two USB-A ports. If you have something connected there, it is brutally difficult to actually put the port inside, and you will end up eventually scratching some portion of the rear side of your Mac Mini. It's a really weird design choice for sure. Overall, my take is that the M2 Pro Mac Mini is one of the best bargains Apple has made in recent history. You're getting every dollar's worth of performance to price ratio over here. This thing is absolutely a beast in its own rights. And for 95% of people, I'd argue it's enough power to get through even the most demanding of workflows. The only people who really need to consider anything higher would be argue people who are doing professional animations or if you have complex coding that requires a lot of processing power, or perhaps you're doing 8K video editing or even higher than that. In those cases, I can see the need for the higher end Max or Ultra chips. Now, of course, it is worth noting, the biggest shortcoming here is going to be the lack of GPU cores. Though, don't take this in the sense that there's not enough GPU cores on the M2 Pro. There are definitely enough to get day-to-day -day activities done and even do some casual gaming again if you're into that on a Mac in the first place. Now, with that said, if you do want to get, let's say, the Mac Studio with the M1 Max chip, you're going to dish out $300 more for the same amount of RAM, the same amount of capacity. It's just not really worth it anymore, unless, again, you have a specific need for the traditional GPU cores. I think the M2 Pro is a fantastic value. Despite its minor flaws, this is one of the best machines I've owned in recent times, and I can wholeheartedly vouch for it. Let me know what you guys think of the M2 Pro Mac Mini. If you have one, what your experience has been like, I'd love to hear all about it. And as always, if you enjoyed the content, please consider subbing to this channel. It genuinely helps me grow and it means the world to me. Catch you in the next one.